Xenoblade Chronicles 2 is a JRPG released in December of 2017. The game was created by Monolith Soft as part of the Xenoblade series and the Xeno Meta series. It's the quote unquote sequel to the critically acclaimed Xenoblade Chronicles released in 2010. I played the original Xenoblade back in late 2016 on the Wii, and I absolutely loved it. It had lovable characters, a fantastic story, beautiful environments, fun gameplay, an amazing soundtrack, and more. Once completing Xenoblade, it quickly became my favorite game of all time. So when I went into Xenoblade 2, I expected the game to be good, of course, but I didn't think that it would even come close to the standards set by the original. But I can definitely say that this game went beyond my expectations. Xenoblade 2 ended up being a lot better than I originally expected. In this video, I will be discussing why I like Xenoblade Chronicles 2 so much. And with the announcement of Pyra and Mithra in Smash Bros, I figured now would be a good time to talk about the game. I'd like to mention that there will be complete spoilers for Xenoblade 2. If you haven't played the game yet, then don't watch this video. I will also talk about spoilers for Torn of the Golden Country, but that will be in a different section at the end of the video. Anyways, let's get started. Xenoblade 2 has an amazing combat system, though it can be a bit hard to understand, especially if you're new to the game. But once you understand it, you can pull off some really fun things. There are two types of people who participate in battle, Blades and Drivers. Blades are a weaponized life form that grants weapons and powers to their drivers. Drivers are regular humans linked to a blade by awakening them with a core crystal. Each blade has their own element. As an example, Pyra is a fire element blade. Each blade has their own strengths and weaknesses, so it's up to the player to figure out how to use them effectively in battle. You have three drivers in battle, one controlled by the player and two others controlled by the AI. Each driver can have three blades equipped to them at once. You can initiate a battle with any enemy in the world. Some enemies attack when seeing you, and others won't attack unless you attack them first. Once within range of an enemy, you can stand still to perform auto attacks. Every time you auto attack, you will slowly build up your arts. Once an art is fully built up, you can use it. Every art has a different effect. Some do high amounts of damage, others can inflict statuses on the enemy such as break, and others can heal the party. You can also switch between blades mid-battle, though there is a cooldown timer that stops you from just switching whenever you want. You'll have to strategically think about when to switch blades. By using arts, you will then build up your special gauge. You can use a special from level 1 all the way up to level 4. Obviously, higher level specials do a lot more damage than a level 1 special, but that's just the absolute basics of the combat. Once learning that, you can then pull off some of the harder stuff, such as blade combos, which you can do by using specials of the correct level and element, and doing that will put an orb on the enemy. Then you can do chain attacks, and when bursting orbs in a chain attack, you will deal a lot more damage and get an extra turn in the chain attack. And if you burst enough orbs, you will fill up this bar called the burst meter, and you will be able to use all of the arts of the blade everyone's using. Then there are driver combos, which can be done when someone uses a break art on an enemy, and then someone else follows up with a topple art, and then using a launch art, which will launch the enemy into the air, and then finally using a smash art to finish the combo by knocking the enemy back on the ground. And finally, you have fusion combos, which can be done by using both blade combos and driver combos at the same time. Once pulling off a fusion combo, you will do massive amounts of damage. Yeah, as you can tell, this combat can be a bit... complicated sounding. It's actually pretty simple to understand once you learn it, but the hard part is learning it. The tutorials in this game are really bad. The tutorials don't explain things fully, sometimes it explains things very poorly, and sometimes the tutorials straight up give out misinformation. There's also no visual demonstration of how to pull off certain things. In the first Xenoblade game, they would give you a picture showing you how to pull something off, but in Xenoblade 2, it's just text. And worst of all, you can't even read the tutorials again. There is no menu that lets you read tutorials. This game can seem very confusing to someone who hasn't played it before, especially to someone who's new to the Xenoblade series. And it doesn't help that the UI looks very cluttered and complicated. There are like six different things on screen to keep track of at once. This game's UI could definitely be better, and it can be a bit confusing when first starting out. 
It took me somewhere around 20 hours of playtime to fully understand driver combos, and about 50 hours to understand blade combos, chain attacks, and fusion combos. And I didn't even learn the combat because of the in-game tutorials. I learned the combat because of a YouTube video tutorial. Even with 170 hours of playtime, I still don't even know everything about the combat. Overall, I love the combat of Xenoblade 2. I think it's extremely fun and satisfying to play, and it has quite a lot of diversity. But it can certainly be hard to understand because of poorly written tutorials and a confusing UI. But once you understand it, it can be really fun and customizable. There's also a ton of customization you can do in this game. You can equip your blades with aux cores and core chips to change their stats and boost their power. Each blade also has an affinity chart full of skills they can learn. You can also equip your drivers with accessories and give them pouch items to change their stats and boost their powers. You can strengthen a driver's arts using WP, and you can use SP to unlock certain skills. There's a wide variety of things to customize, and it allows for some pretty diverse gameplay. You can unlock more blades by using core crystals, which is literally just gotcha. You can find core crystals all around the world, and you can use them to summon a random blade. Some are common blades, and some are rare blades, with rare blades having unique designs and personalities. A lot of people aren't very big fans of the gotcha system in this game, but I personally enjoy it. At first, I wasn't very big on it, but over time it grew on me. I think it adds a nice amount of replayability to the game, because next time I play through the game, I might get completely different blades, which would allow for a completely different party setup. It's also really nice that they didn't add microtransactions. The only way to get core crystals is by unlocking them by playing the game. And yes, there is the $30 Expansion Pass DLC, which gives you tons of core crystals. But you can only buy that one time, and it adds tons of extra stuff to the game, so I don't really count it. You can also unlock certain rare blades by progressing through the story, or doing certain side quests. Which I think is nice, in case you don't want to do the gotcha stuff. And a lot of the blades you get from doing the story and side content are actually really good. There are also tons of side quests in the world that you can complete. But, in my opinion, the quests are pretty lackluster. A lot of them are just fetch quests, where someone tells you to get a specific amount of a specific item, or kill a specific amount of enemies. They can be quite tedious sometimes. There are a good amount of quests with interesting stories, but most are pretty generic. Most of the NPCs in this game also aren't all that memorable, so that really didn't incentivize me to do the side quests. But I especially love the blade quests. Each rare blade you obtain through Gacha has its own fully voice acted side quest, and they are easily my favorite kind of side quest in the game, since they actually build upon the characters of these blades and give them a personality outside of battle. But overall, the quests in this game aren't bad, they just really aren't anything all that special, and are pretty generic. Sometimes in the world, you can come across Heart to Hearts which are fully voice acted cutscenes where you get to bond with your party members and rare blades. I absolutely love these, since they are a nice way to build relations with characters outside of story progression. There are some really great and memorable moments in these heart-to-hearts as well. Overall, Xenoblade 2 has some really nice gameplay, though the gameplay definitely has its weak spots, such as bad tutorials that don't explain the combat well, and a lot of tedious side quests. But once you understand the combat and look past certain gameplay flaws, it's a really fun game that you can easily sink hundreds of hours into. But now, let's talk about the world design and visuals. Xenoblade 2 has a very large and vast open world to explore. The world takes place on Titans, and some areas even take place inside of Titans. The world has tons of diverse areas to explore. There's a large green field, a giant cave inside of a Titan, a large desert wasteland, a giant tree that's mechanical on the inside, a big snowy Titan, an archipelago of island Titans, just to name a few. The world is very large, with tons of different locations to discover and branching paths. It's honestly super fun to go around and find different things in the world. Most of the areas in this game are very large, and it's actually incredible that they managed to fit it all on the Switch. And the game rewards exploration by hiding treasure chests and collection points all around the map for you to find. The game also rewards you with experience points every time you discover a new location. The world of Allrest is absolutely beautiful. Sometimes I just pause and take in all the scenery. There are so many absolutely beautiful locations to see in this game. My personal favorite looking area, Uriah, looks absolutely beautiful with the orange and purple colors and the shimmering scenery. Not just Uriah, but almost every single area in this game is absolutely beautiful. 
This world is full of such unique, inspired, diverse, and beautiful areas. They do a fantastic job at immersing you in the world with little details. As an example, on the Gormot Titan, you can see the head of the Titan moving around. I absolutely love the world design, and it's easily one of my favorite aspects of this game. While you're exploring, you might come across a field skill check, where your blades will use field skills they have unlocked to interact with the world. It sounds pretty nice, but in reality, it can be a bit annoying. You can only use field skills from blades you have equipped, so if you don't meet the requirements, you have to dig through your blade list to find blades that have the specific skill you need. And if you don't have a blade with the right skill, then you have to gotcha for more and hope you get lucky. And even if you do have a blade with the right skill, it might not be a high enough level, so you have to go and level up the skill by completing some random generic task. I don't mind the field skill checks that much when they're optional, but there's several points where the game forces you to complete field skill checks in order to progress the story. I remember getting stuck at several of these points because I didn't have enough blades with the skill I needed, so I had to go and get core crystals so I could hopefully get a blade with the specific skill. I like the concept of field skill checks, and they certainly do add interactivity to the world, but in reality, they can be quite tedious sometimes. Now I'd like to discuss the actual art style of this game. The original Xenoblade game on the Wii had a more realistic art style. So when Xenoblade 2 was first announced, the more anime art style was a bit divisive in the Xenoblade community. I didn't really know what to think of the anime art style at first. I didn't like it, but I didn't hate it. But as I played the game, I can definitely say that I think the art style is actually really good and is a lot better than the original Xenoblade's art style. It allows for more vibrant colors that make everything pop a lot more. And I think that the art style allows for more expressive facial expressions in the characters. It's not really a surprise why they decided to use a similar style for the definitive edition of the original Xenoblade. I think the anime art style is a huge improvement over the more realistic art style, and I think that it adds a lot more charm and color to the game. Overall, Xenoblade 2 has great world design and visuals, with a fun and beautiful world to explore, and a really nice art style. But now, let's talk about the soundtrack and voice acting. The music of Xenoblade 2 is absolutely fantastic. The soundtrack does an excellent job at immersing you in the game, and it complements the game very well. Xenoblade 2 has a nice variety of music. It has calm and atmospheric music. It has high-energy battle music. It has emotional music, and that's just scratching the surface. This soundtrack is without a doubt my favorite soundtrack of any game. The soundtrack fits this game amazingly well, and honestly, it may sound weird, but the soundtrack is easily one of the best aspects of this game. This game would not feel complete without the soundtrack. However, something I have noticed is that a lot of times, the music can be so loud that it overshadows the voice acting in the cutscenes. Even at the maximum voice acting volume, it's still very noticeable in certain scenes. Sometimes it's so bad, I can't even hear what the characters are saying without reading the subtitles, even with the voice acting at max volume. It's not really that big of an issue, but it's definitely something that I noticed, and it can be quite annoying sometimes. It really doesn't matter what I say here, because you probably can't hear me that much anyways, but uh... I guess we'll move on to the next part. This isn't that big of an issue, it's just something that I definitely noticed. Now, let's talk about the voice acting. The English voice acting of Xenoblade 2 is a pretty controversial topic, and it was easily one of the biggest criticisms of this game at launch. But honestly, the voice acting isn't nearly as bad as some people make it out to be. In fact, I actually think the voice acting is pretty good. Sure, there are some pretty bad moments at the start, but later in the game, the voice acting actually gets pretty good. There are a few bad moments from characters like Rex, especially some of the screams. But I actually think Rex's voice actor, Al Weaver, does a good job at the screams later in the game. And Rex's crying is pretty well done. I actually didn't really like Rex's voice at first, but the more I played the game, it grew on me a lot, and honestly, I think I like Rex's voice a lot. Certain characters like Nia have a few poorly delivered moments, but for the most part, their voice acting is really good. I don't think any voice actor in this game is genuinely bad. There are a few weird line deliveries here and there, but most of it is pretty solid. But characters like Malos, Pyra and Mithra, Morag, Vandam, Zeke, Poppy, Amalthus, and many more all have fantastic voice acting, and I can't really think of any poorly done scenes from them. 
This game does have some pretty low points when it comes to voice acting, but when it has high points in the voice acting, they are really good. Also, the lip syncing doesn't match the English voice acting at all, and it can definitely be noticeable sometimes, but it never really bothered me as much as it bothered other people. I don't even think it's the voice actor's fault for a lot of the poorly done scenes. I think a lot of the issues fall onto the bad voice directing. The character's animation barely matches the voice acting a lot of the time. It honestly feels like they didn't even see the scene they were voice acting. So I really don't think it's the voice actor's fault, more a lack of good voice direction. The first Xenoblade has easily some of the best English voice acting I've heard in any game ever, and the second game doesn't even come close to the standard set by the first game. But that isn't to say that the second game's voice acting is bad, it's still pretty well done, and honestly, the voice acting is not nearly as bad as people make it sound. Overall, Xenoblade 2 has an absolutely fantastic soundtrack, and it stands as my favorite soundtrack of all time. And the voice acting of this game is pretty good, but it does have some bad points. Anyways, now let's talk about the... character design. You knew this was coming. It's time to talk about the character design. Everyone's favorite topic! I'm gonna try to keep this section somewhat short since this has been talked about hundreds of times and you're probably tired of hearing about it. But it's easily the most common criticism I hear of this game and I feel like it's necessary to talk about. I think most of the character designs are pretty good. The main characters look fantastic, and the vibrant colors really make them pop. Morag has my personal favorite design out of every character in the game. It might be a bit of a controversial take, but Rex's design isn't even nearly as bad as people say. My only real issue with his design is that it just looks way too much like a generic JRPG protagonist. But Rex eventually gets a new design later in the game, and it looks way better. And the antagonists have really nice designs as well, even though they do look a bit like stereotypical JRPG antagonists. And the majority of the blade designs are pretty cool. I really like that they got tons of different artists to draw the rare blades, even if it does result in a bit of a design clash, but it never bothered me too much. I think getting different artists to draw different blades makes it feel like each rare blade is unique in its own way. However, the issue I have with the character design is the over-sexualization. What? I'm just taking pictures of the beautiful background. Man, this game is brilliant. Why does Pyra look like this? It's completely pointless and ridiculous. Pyra is supposed to be kind-hearted, soft-spoken, and somewhat self-conscious. So why does she look like this? It doesn't fit her character at all, it's just completely pointless. It's only there for the point of having fan service. I actually really like the color palette of Pyra's design. I think the red outfit with the glowing green lines looks pretty cool, but her revealing outfit just ruined her design for me. It's not just Pyra either, a lot of the characters look like this, most notably Mithra and a lot of the female rare blades. And certain characters like Dahlia are just so absolutely dumb that it's actually kinda funny. Like these are just straight up cylinders at this point. I really like Dahlia as a character. She's very nice, charming, and has this very motherly attitude. But why does she have to look absolutely ridiculous? And even outside of just the designs, there are also just tons of weird and unnecessary camera angles, and it just proves that they absolutely knew what they were doing. There's also just a bunch of random fan service scenes, such as the infamous sleepwalking scene, where Mithra wakes up in Rex's bed, and they zoom in on her and they add boing sound effects. Or perhaps the hot spring scene, where they zoom in on Mithra and add sparkle sound effects. If I'm gonna be honest, I don't actually mind the designs that much. What I mainly don't like about it is that it turns people off of playing the game, because they see these designs and immediately think it's some trash anime game and they don't even give it a chance. I love this game a lot, and it sucks to see people not play it because of a few bad character designs. But I can't blame those people for thinking like that, because honestly, if this game didn't have Xenoblade in the title, I would not have played it. I personally couldn't care less, but it still sucks that these designs are in the game because it turns people away from this fantastic game. Pyra and Mithra are genuinely incredible characters, but I've seen so many people write them off as bad just because of their designs. It's honestly pretty disappointing. But anyways, now let's talk about what I would say is the primary reason I play the Xenoblade games. The story and the characters.
The story is the main reason I play Xenoblade, and thankfully, this game did not disappoint. The story is without any doubt my favorite aspect of this game, and it's one of the best stories I've ever seen in any game. You play as Rex, who is a young kid who salvages for things in the Cloud Sea. The Cloud Sea is, well, a sea of clouds. It's pretty self-explanatory. The world takes place on top of Titans in the world of All Rest. However, those Titans begin to die out. Rex has a lifelong goal of making it to Elysium, a fabled paradise where there's enough room for everyone. Rex gets asked by Banna, the chairman of the Argentum Trade Guild, to salvage for items in a ship wreckage in uncharted waters, with the reward for completing the job being 200,000 gold. Rex agrees, and Chairman Banna introduces Jin, Malos, Nia, and their blades, Dromark and Sever. The group head down to the wreckage, and on the ship they find the legendary blade known as the Aegis. Rex decides to touch the sword after being told not to, then Jin kills Rex and the game ends. Yes, I know, very funny joke. I'm actually a professional comedian. Rex wakes up in a dream of Elysium and meets the legendary Aegis named Pyra. Pyra asks Rex to take her to the real Elysium, and after some questionable dialogue, she brings Rex back to life by giving him half of her life force, and Rex becomes the driver of the Aegis. Nia betrays Malos and Jin, Pyra and Rex then fight them off, and that's where the story begins. I think this is a pretty good opening, since it gives the player a nice amount of backstory to the world, and you get shown a lot of the basic mechanics of the game. And the awakening of the Aegis cutscene is a really nice part of the opening, since it really gets the player invested in the story right away. After this point, the story does slow down, and it gives the player a bit of a breather. You get to meet a lot of new characters, and the game gives you the first big grassy open world area to explore. However, I do find that the story has a few pacing issues. The entirety of Chapter 4 is literally just a side story where you have to stop Tora's other maid robot, Lila, from being under the control of Banna. Now that's some 10 out of 10 writing right there. To me, it just feels out of place, and it just feels like unnecessary time padding. And I really wasn't invested in anything going on in this chapter. The chapter is also filled with unnecessary fan service scenes that just add insult to injury. It's easily my least favorite part of the story. The story does take a bit too long to really get going in my opinion. The story only really gets interesting midway through chapter 5. But that isn't to say that stuff before that is bad. There is a lot of really great character interaction and world building scenes. But once the story really gets going, it is really good. Once chapter 6 begins, I can barely think of any parts that I don't like. Everything past chapter 5 is just absolutely fantastic. Towards the end of the game, it takes a more sci-fi, depressing, and dark turn, and I absolutely love it, and I think it's incredibly well done. There are so many amazing moments in this story. The story is by far my favorite aspect of this game, and it's easily one of the best stories of any game I've ever played. I could easily keep praising the story, but honestly, we'd be here for way too long, since it's just such a long story. So, I'll just move on to the characters. This game easily has one of the best cast of characters I've seen in any game. They all feel so lively and have really great chemistry with each other. There really is not a single character in this game I don't like. Traitor, traitor, traitor! Nia, you're one of the baddies now, you villain! Okay, well actually there's one I really don't like, but every other character is absolutely fantastic. Each character has their own colorful and lively personalities, which makes them all feel unique, and the dynamic between characters is really interesting because of that. I really loved all the character interaction in this game, and in my opinion, the characters are a large reason as to why the story works so well. I absolutely love how each character has their own arc throughout the story. Even the antagonists are incredible. The antagonists get a lot of character development as well, and they have their own relationships with each other, which I think is really great. Jin is actually my favorite character in the entire game, and possibly the entire Xenoblade series, since I think he has some really fantastic moments, and I think he's an incredibly well-done tragic villain. And I think he has some amazing development throughout the game. Overall, I love the story and characters of this game, and it's without any doubt my favorite aspect of this game. And it's absolutely one of my favorite stories I've ever seen in any game. Anyways, now I'm gonna talk about the DLC prequel story, Torn of the Golden Country. And as a reminder, if you couldn't already tell, there's gonna be complete spoilers for Torna, so skip this chapter of the video if you haven't played the game yet. Anyways, let's talk about that.
Return of the Golden Country is a DLC expansion for Xenoblade 2, released in September of 2018. The expansion tells the story of the Aegis War, which takes place 500 years prior to the events of the main game. So let's start off by talking about the gameplay. There's quite a lot of changes to the combat in this DLC. You still keep your basic auto attacks and arts, but now instead of switching between blades to use in battle, you can now switch between characters to play as in battle, though there is a cooldown timer to how often you can swap. Once you take damage from an enemy, you can swap to another character to recover a lot of your health. This is a nice feature since it really makes you think about when to switch characters. Blade combos have also been streamlined. You no longer need to use specific blade elements to pull off a blade combo. You can use any element you want. The battle UI has been improved just a little bit. It's not much better, but it's still an improvement from the main game's UI. The combat is way easier to understand now and much less complex than the main game. I don't really know which combat system I like more, since I do like Torna's simplicity, but also Xenoblade 2's combat feels much less repetitive and has more diversity. Honestly, I think both combat systems are on equal terms for me. Outside of combat, there are also a few different gameplay features. Collection points now show what type of collectibles it has, which is a really useful quality of life change that makes side questing a bit easier. There's also a new camp system where you can craft items, rest, and chat with the party. I really love this, and for some reason, it's honestly one of my new favorite features from this DLC. There's also a new community feature, which is like a more simplified version of the first Xenoblade's affinity chart. Every time you meet a new NPC, it will register them in the community section. And each time you complete a side quest from an NPC, they become supporters of the party. Once you get a certain amount of supporters, the community level will increase. I really like this community feature, but also, I'm probably the only person who likes the affinity chart in the first game, so... My only issue with the community system is that at one point in the story, you need to reach community level 4 to progress. And in order to do that, you need to register 64 NPCs as your supporters in order to reach that level. It's honestly just a bunch of quest grinding, and it really just felt like padding to me. Visually, this game looks surprisingly a lot better than Xenoblade 2. The lighting just looks way better, and it's absolutely fantastic. And just like the base game, there are so many beautiful areas to see in this DLC. The world design is also really great. There are some really fantastic and fun areas to explore in this game. I'd say the world design is probably just as good as the world design in Xenoblade 2, if not just a little bit better. However, the town design is just amazing. The capital of Torna, Auresco, is just amazing looking and is by far my favorite town in the whole series. The soundtrack is absolutely great as well. It reuses certain songs from the main game, however, they did add some new songs. The new songs have more of a jazz style, and I think it works very well and it sounds excellent. The voice acting is also improved in this game. There wasn't a single moment in the game where I didn't like the voice acting. I think each character sounds incredible, and I just think that the voice actors did a really good job. The voice acting in the ending especially is just so great and fits the scene perfectly. I really like the story of this game. It's nothing we hadn't already kind of heard from Xenoblade 2, but it's nice to see it as its own game. Most of the story is just character interaction and more backstory. We only really get to see something crazy happen at the ending. The ending shows Mithra fighting Malos, and during this fight, Mithra and Malos end up destroying all of Torna and killing multiple people. While we already knew what happened in the Aegis War due to the base game, it's much more emotional when you see it all happen and play through it. After this cutscene though, you have a boss fight against Gort, and honestly, to me, this fight just felt kind of out of place. You have this really emotional ending where tons of people die, including main characters, and an entire titan is destroyed, and then you just get whatever this is. I think this part would have been fine if they just put it before the destruction of Torna, but here it just feels sorta out of place. After that, we get to see a credit scene of their lives after the Aegis War. Other than that small fight with Gord at the end, I think the ending is just incredible. It's easily one of the best and most impactful endings I've seen of any game. The characters of this game are also really great. The majority of the story is just character interaction, but I really like that. It gives more backstory to certain characters that didn't get much screen time in the base game, such as Hayes, Laura, Minoth, etc. I also think characters like Jin and Mithra are much more likable after Torna. It's actually thanks to Torna that Jin is my favorite character in the main game. And a lot of the scenes in the base game, such as Jin's death and Hayes' death, are way more impactful after playing Torna. Overall, I think Torna the Golden Country is incredible, and I think it adds so much more depth to the world and characters of Allrest. Anyways, 
on to my final conclusion about the world of Xenoblade Chronicles 2 as a whole. Xenoblade Chronicles 2 is an amazing game that unfortunately gets overlooked by its bad tutorials, complex combat system, character designs, voice acting, and story pacing. But if you can get past those issues, it really is an amazing game and one of the best games on the Switch. The game has fantastic gameplay with a lot of diversity in playstyles. The game has an incredible soundtrack. In fact, it's my favorite video game soundtrack ever. The game visually looks fantastic and has an incredibly big and beautiful world to explore. The game also has one of the greatest stories of any game ever and one of the best and most memorable cast of characters in any game I've ever played. This game is an unforgettable experience. Torn of the Golden Country also has a good story, amazing characters, fantastic gameplay, brilliant soundtrack, beautiful world, and good voice acting. Xenoblade 2 is by far one of my favorite games of all time. I think that Xenoblade 2 is an amazing sequel, and it definitely lives up to the expectations set by the first game. And that's all I have to say for now. I hope that you enjoyed this video. Thanks for watching, and don't forget to go and drink some water. Goodbye.